I'll try to be brief. Uh, our next presenter is Survati Reddy. She's a master's candidate soon to graduate from my lab. Uh, she got her undergraduate degree in pharmaceutical sciences from the Institute of Chemical Technology located in Mumbai, India. And then she moved to Edmonton to pursue master's in chemistry working under supervision of Dr. Atmir Durda, that's me. Uh, her research focuses on development of phage display enabled tools to provide anti-glycan antibodies in serum. Sarati, floor is yours. Thank you for the introduction. Um, let me share my screen. Okay, thank you so much for the introduction, uh, Rathmir. Uh, I want to start the talk by talking a little bit about COVID. I know it's a grim introduction, but it's the reality that we are living in a pandemic world and everything from scientific publications to social media to preprint servers is bombarded with the term antibody in it. And it also shows the importance of understanding antibodies better, both for fundamental research as well as uh, developing therapeutics and diagnostics. In my project, I am looking at a class of molecules called anti-glycan antibodies. So as the term suggests, these antibodies are proteins generated against carbohydrates or glycans. And human serum has a diverse assortment of um, these antibodies, which are generated as a response to glycans, either present on the surface of pathogens, for example, mycobacterium that causes tuberculosis, vaccines, Recently, there is a lot of interest in studying antibodies generated against the glycosylated spike protein of coronaviruses and even tumor cells. For example, antibodies against sialic acids that have been detected in cancer patients since there is an overexpression over on cancer cells. So to summarize, antibodies are critical for locating and monitoring expression of carbohydrates and defining their biological roles. And in this image, as summarized by Gildersleeve Group at the NIH, that does a lot of anti-glycan antibody work. Um, there are very few anti-glycan antibodies so far that have been developed against carbohydrates, both for basic research as well as clinical applications. Um, to talk about some existing platforms and method of detection of these anti-glycan antibodies, uh, traditional methods like ITC and SPR were used earlier in the 80s to study carbohydrate protein interaction like mono or oligosaccharide inhibition studies, uh, but they are labor intensive and also require large quantities of carbohydrate. And molecular recognition is also dependent on carbohydrate presentation. And typically, monovalent interactions between a single carbohydrate ligand and single binding domain of a protein are weak. And that's why glycan arrays came into picture. And um, we are not the first ones to develop a glycan array, starting with Dr. Fezzi in the 1980s, who first made these arrays on silica plates, followed by the Gildersleeve group in 1996, who did it on BSA and ELISA plates. And then came the printed glycan array, uh, where glycans are printed on the glass slide by the Imperial College and uh, Consortium of Functional Genomics, uh, glycomics, sorry. And then came Luminex array, where there are fluorescently labeled microspheres where each microsphere has a different wavelength and readout. And more recently, the DNA encoded glycan array where one glycan is attached to one barcode of DNA. And each one of these techniques has some or the other limitations. So with many detection methods already available, what am I trying to do is uh, profile the anti-glycan antibodies from a complex mixture like a human serum using a PCR and deep sequencing based multiplex platform, which is the liquid glycan array. And I will refer to it as LIGA for the rest of my talk. And the kind of antibodies that I'm looking at for my project is naturally occurring antibodies, the blood group antibodies. So LIGA is a platform previously developed in the lab and recently published is based on DNA barcoded M13 bacteriophage that can display up to 30 to 1500 glycan copies per phage and LIGA can be pulled down by target proteins and bound phages can be deep sequenced to identify the structure as well as the density of glycans. Now, uh, this technology developed in our lab has been uh, used to study the glycan binding profile of lectins on cells in vitro and immune cells in a live mouse. In my project, I am taking it one step ahead by using it to profile antibodies against carbohydrates in a more complex environment like the human serum. And 
like I just mentioned, we all know that antibodies against glycans don't just exist in disease patients, but also in normal and healthy individuals. And that is exactly what I'm studying, looking at the ABO blood group antibodies. Give you a quick introduction of the ABO's blood group system, the AB and H, um, H being representative of blood group O, the genes encode for glycosyltransferases that add carbohydrate units to form the ABH glycans. And these antigens are key glycans that, de that define our blood type. And the minimal structure that defines the blood group A and B determinant is a trisaccharide, as you can see here. And for blood group O is a disaccharide. And these di and trisaccharides are appended to different carrier glycan chains that results in 18 different subtypes, which are expressed in different cells and tissues in the body. I am focusing on the, sorry, the blood group, minimal blood group determinant, which is the tri and isaccharide. And it is well known that individuals possess antibodies to ABH blood group antigens that are not present within their body. Uh, for example, if you're blood type O, you will have a anti-A and anti-B antibody. If you're blood type A, then you will have anti-B. And if you're blood type B, then you'll have anti-A. However, I should mention your studies have shown that this is not always true. And there are also some autobodies, auto antibodies that are detected. In my project, I am mimicking the presentation of di and trisaccharide component of the abl glycans displayed on RBCs on M13 phage. So the outer coat of phage protein serves as a scaffold and allows us to attach multiple antigens. And a, there's a unique DNA barcode inside the phage, which allows for genetic encoding and profiling of uh, antigen and antibody interaction. Uh, talking about the chemistry and the characterization technique we use, we use strain promoted azide alkaline cycloaddition method developed by the Bertozzi group to attach the glycans on the phage, we first acylate the phage particles with dibenzocyclooctane, NHS, DB, DBCO, NHS ester, that acylates the N terminus of the PA protein, followed by ligation of glycans that have an azido alkyl linker. And quality control of this ligation is done using multi top mass spectrometry. Now, the peaks that you see here are not from a single clone of phage, but a mixture of 10 phage clones, each with a unique DNA barcode. Since it's a mixture of silent DNA barcodes, I call them MSDBs. And as you can see from the MALDI spectra here, my library has three blood group trisaccharide antigens, A, B, and O, and a control azetoethanol, which is just the DBCO linker. And um, traditionally in LIGA, there is one glycan per page. So there's one to one correspondence, but here I mix 10 different clones, each with a unique barcode and then conjugate to the glycan. The reason for this is um, for statistical purposes and to understand the robustness of the assay. So technologies like DNA encoded libraries or the one like ours that uses affinity selection, which is enrichment for binding to a target using target immobilization. And this approach complements the traditional high throughput screening, which is assay of many, many compounds in parallel using automated robots. And in the 90s, uh, there was uh, DuPont Pharmaceutical came up with a statistical parameter that evaluates the robustness of the assay, and they called it a Z factor. Before that, there was no specific uh, statistical parameter that could calculate the robustness of biological assays. And in theory, a robust assay is the one that will give reproducible results every single time you run the same experiment. This parameter is not very well established for in vitro selection assays yet. And while doing selection assays, there are different parameters that can affect the final outcome. In using a technology like LIGA, it can be the amount of input sample that I put in, the number of washes, human error, PCR bias, et cetera. And having 10 clones attached to a single glycan allows to measure the binding response to antibodies 10 times, which can be used to evaluate how similar or different it is every time I run the experiment. So once our phage glycan conjugates were made, the first step of validation was ELISA. 96 well plates are coated with purified mouse 
polyclonal IgM, monoclonal IgM antibodies, sorry, that are typically used in clinical labs to determine the blood type. And we got these antibodies from Dr. Laurie West group at the University of Alberta. And then we add the phage lichen conjugates and uh, wash it to remove the non-binders and detect the bound phage with antiphage antibody and then uh, add the TMB substrate and phosphoric acid for detection. Next was to do an antibody dilution study to see what concentration or dilution of antibody I should be using for all my experiments. Um, literature suggested that typically a range between one in 1,000 to one in 5,000 was used. So I went ahead and tested those dilutions. And since this assay is done in a well, of a plate as compared to spots on a glass array slide, I wanted to coat the well with as much antibody as possible and not over dilute it. So I went ahead with one in 1000 and one in 2000 dilution. Next, I wanted to check the amount of phage that I should add for my experiments. And the EC50 here is around 10 to the six phage particles. And for my future experiments, I went ahead by adding 10 to the six phage concentration of phage glycan conjugates. Next was to uh, screen the glycan library on anti-A and anti-B antibodies. And we do this by first coating the plates with the purified monoclonal IgM antibodies, and then adding the glycan library, washing it to remove the non-binders, eluting the binders with acid, and then PCR amplifying the eluted phage and deep sequencing it. And I tested this on two different platforms, one on a 96 well plate and the other one was on magnetic beads. And as you can see here for the same ABO library tested on two different platforms, we got a higher signal for antibodies coated on plate as compared to that of beads. We think that IgM type of antibodies used in this assay did not really bind to the magnetic beads and hence we see no response. So, all the assays henceforth were done on plates. Next, uh, I moved to a more complex environment from a focused library that only had ABO glycans. I moved to a more complex library with 65 other glycans that were not necessarily uh, lip truth glycans and tested it again on anti-A and anti-B purified antibodies. You can see here the response that I got from the focused library, the trisaccharide response is seen along with that some tetrasaccharide, for example, for anti-B, B tetra L and um, B tetra type one, glycan is seen to be binding to anti-B antibody coated on the plate. And this audience knows that valency and representation of glycans on a scaffold is very important to study um, antigen antibody or glycan glycan binding protein response. So I created a bigger library that had antigens, glycans of different densities ranging from 30 copies from 150 copies of phage to uh, 1500 copies of phage. Seen here on the top, green is for antigen A and the red one is for antigen B. And again, they were screened on anti-A and anti-B antibodies coated on plates. Um, antigens with the highest density, which is around 1500 copies of glycan shows the highest response. And using this data, I also calculated the Z factor, which I, if you recall, mentioned uh, a few slides ago. It's this, this um, calculation is to see the band separation between the test and the control. And if the Z factor is between 0.5 to one, then it indicates that the assay is robust. And for anti-A antibody here, the value was around 0.82, and for anti-B it was around 0.57, which shows that the assay is reproducible. Now, moving on to a more complex system from purified monoclonal antibodies, my goal was to uh, identify IgG and IgM blood group antibodies from the human serum. To do that, I tested around 25 different serum samples, which were a kind gift from, again, Dr. Lori West and also Gildersleeve Group at the NIH. And on the left side here is the patient IDs, and on the right side is 
uh, the blood type and the results are shown in the form of heat map. And the response that you see here is a fold change, which means we compare a test with the control and do a differential enrichment analysis. And that's how we plot this. And this is a log to the base two fold change response. Um, traditionally, if you are blood type A, like I mentioned earlier, you would not see any uh, blood anti-A antibody, and if you're O, then you will have both A and B. However, in reality, that is not always true. And for reference, we also have anti-A and anti-B antibody shown here. And not only the focus library, again, we tested some of these serum samples with a bigger library that had glycans uh, other than blood group glycans. And some of the blood group glycans, maybe the tetrasaccharide or other subtypes are shown in red here. And we do see some response of the tetracycride for some of the individuals, but not for all of them. Our next goal was to compare the platform that we developed to some of the existing arrays. As I mentioned before, there are different arrays that already exist, the traditional glass array, Luminex array, which is on uh, fluorescently labeled microspheres, neoglycoprotein, where glycans are presented on BSA, and LIGA, which is the one developed by us. And the glass and Luminex measurements were done by um, Gildersleeve group as well as Lori West group. And um, so there are two reasons to do this study is first to see if we see a response for antibodies using LIGA at all. And the second reason is to see if there is um, any repetition or if our assay agrees with other assay or if there, if there are some differences. And the values here for um, glass and luminex are mean fluorescence intensities. Again, these are different platforms. And for um, LIGA, it's in the form of fold change because it's a sequencing based assay. And again, we see here that the, all four assays agree with each other. So key takeaways from this talk is uh, we developed a phage display and steep sequencing based multiplex platform to study glycan antibody interaction. Um, as of now, we have only worked on detecting naturally occurring ABO antibodies in a complex environment like the human serum, but I'm sure that we can extrapolate this to detect antibodies in diseased patients. And um, comparison with other existing glycanary platforms is underway, and I think that will give us a good idea about how LIGA performs in comparison to other existing assays. With that, I would like to acknowledge my group, my supervisor, Dr. Rahmer Derda, collaborators, um, Todd Lowry, who made the Todd Lowry's group who made the uh, ABO glycans that you saw here today, Gildersleeve group and Laurie West group gave us the serum samples and members of Laurie West group were really helpful in doing the Luminex measurements and um, giving us their support. I'm happy to answer any questions. <laughs>